In this video, I'm going to be explaining how we can find the volume of a solid using a technique called the washer method. And we want to use this method uh, whenever we are finding the volume of a graph that gets rotated and creates a solid. And that solid has some sort of a gap or a hole in between it so that there's a gap or a hole in between our curves. So using this washer method where we create a hole in our disk gives us a much more accurate representation of the volume rather than using a full disk, which does not take into account the gap. So we'll see uh, an example of that when we get to our example. But first, let's try and figure out how we can find the volume of a washer shape. Or if a washer doesn't make any sense to you, you can think about it as a donut. It is a shape with a hole cut out of it. So in our last video, we figured out how to find the volume of a disk. It was our radius squared times pi. That was our surface area of the circle. And if we multiply that by the width or the height of our cylinder, that gave us the volume. Well, this time we have a hole taken out. So how do we cut a hole out? Well, if we take the entire circle's surface area and subtract the smaller circle's area from that, then that should give us the resulting shaded in or outer little ring there. So in two dimensional terms, we could look at this picture. We're gonna have this outside radius, this bigger radius, the radius of the big circle, but that's gonna represent the height of our outer function or top function. The small radius, so the radius of our smaller circle or the hole that we're taking out, going to be represented by lowercase r so that we can tell the difference between our r's and that's going to represent the hole that we take out. So I'm going to take the area of the big circle which we knew from our last video is just r squared times pi times our width. Our width turned into our change of x on our interval. And now we just got the same thing but with a tinier R representing the tiny radius. And so if we subtract the surface area or volume of our small circle away from the big one, then we get the result of the outside with the hole taken out. So pi could be factored out of both of those. The width could also be factored out and then turned into our change of x. And then if we turn that into an integration problem, where we're finding the area between curves and then spinning it, this is what we're actually trying to figure out. So A and B are gonna be the intervals in between our graphs, or the intersection points of our graphs. We're gonna square the radius or the output of each function, or we're just gonna square the function. And we're gonna square our inner function or inner curve and subtract those two things and then we can integrate and multiply by pi to finish it off. We can do that rotating around the x-axis or a horizontal axis of revolution where we do everything in terms of x or we could flip it, spin around the y-axis and do everything in terms of y. Either way it's pretty much the exact same formula just in terms of x and in terms of y. So we're actually going to do both when we do our example, and we can compare similarities and see what differences result. So we're going to be finding the volume resulting from the solid that's formed by revolving the region bounded by these graphs. So the first thing we have to do is find uh, the area in between our two graphs. We need to find the intersection points of our graphs so that we can find the area between it. So that's our first thing. Since we're in terms of x, we can set our equations equal to each other and find their intersection points on the x-axis. So at the x value 0 and the x value 1, we have the intersection of our two curves. So now we know the bounds of our integration or the bounds of our area in between the two graphs. If you visualize your graph or look at a graphing utility, then you can hopefully tell which is the top curve and which is the bottom curve or which is the outer curve and which is the inner curve 
Otherwise, you have to use test values that are on your interval and determine which outputs are greater. So if I plug in 0.5 in between 0 and 1 into both of these, then I can determine which function is greater and which function is lesser. If I square root 0.5, I get about 0.7. If I square 0.5, I get about 0.25. So this value is greater. So that's telling me that the square root of x is our top or outside curve. And x squared is our inside curve. So x squared is going to represent the radius of our inside circles. And the square root of x is going to represent the radius of our outside circles as we're spinning around. So I'm going to take my outer curve, or the square root of x, and square it and get x. I'm going to take my inner curve, or x squared, and square it and get x to the fourth. I'm going to subtract those two squares and integrate. So find the antiderivative, evaluate it at the top and bottom limits of integration. And the last step is to multiply pi. So in doing so, we can find that the resulting volume is about 3 tenths of pi, or 3 pi over 10, or about 0.942. Let's do the exact same example, except this time we're going to spin it or revolve it around the y-axis. Anytime we're doing things around the y-axis, we want our equations in terms of y rather than x. So what we can do is take our two equations and solve for x so that everything is in terms of y. So if I take x squared equals y and square both sides, now I have x equals y squared. So now our equation is in terms of y. We do the same thing with y equals x squared. And this time solve for x instead. So we're going to square root both sides and get x equals the square root of y. And this might seem counterintuitive, but what just happened is our graphs flipped. So the outer curve is now the square root of y. This outer curve, sorry. It was originally x squared, but now it's the square root of y. And that turns out to be the outside curve, because now we're spinning this way. So our outside curve is this one. Our inside curve is this one. And so now our inside curve is y squared, which was originally the square root of x. So either visualize it, or we can do it algebraically. We can find our intersection y values by setting our equations in terms of y equal to each other and solving. And we find that the y values of our intersections are at 0 and 1. So now we're looking at the y-axis for our intersection values. And now we just got to take our inner curve squared and subtract it from our outer curve squared. And again, you can test values to figure out which is your outside or which is your inner, or you can visualize it. So if we square the square root of y, we just get y. And if we square y squared, that's a typo. That should be y squared squared. We get y to the fourth. And now we can integrate in terms of y. Notice how our limits of integration are the y values of intersection, and our equations are in terms of y, and we're integrating in terms of y. So we find the antiderivative evaluated at our upper and lower limits of integration, and multiply by pi. And we end up getting the exact same thing. And that should make sense. Our solid didn't change its shape. It just changed which direction it was spinning. So the resulting volume shouldn't be any different. So again, we're using the washer method because we have this gap in between our graphs. We want to take care of that hole that's being created and not include that hole in our resulting volume. So we use the washer method rather than the disk method to get a more accurate representation of the volume created when that shape gets spun.